Let's go ahead and get ourselves started. Okay, what we would like to do today is uh, kind of take a look at a couple of concepts just in a little more detail to kind of get you ready for what you need for your assignment two to get turned in. And also, uh, well, yeah, we're just really kind of get to set up the stage for getting everything turned in. The second part of the class, what I'd love to do is just actually just turn you loose, let you work on your projects, uh, answer questions, and all that type of stuff. We'll do our best to get around to as many people as possible. So I'll try to do a little bit of budgeting. After I get two or three questions for each of you, we're going to move on. Because you know, it starts getting longer than that to sort of split our time evenly. You know, please come back for some of the office hours. So tonight, uh, starting at 6 o'clock and then continuing to 9 o'clock, uh, the TAs and myself will be around and hopefully filling some things. Except for the first part, I'll be up there with Charles' class. And we'll do whatever we can to kind of like make it all work. So we'll try and get you lots of help in there. So. Let's go ahead and get ourselves started so you have some time available to work. What I really wanted to go through and talk about today is really just the whole notion of the annotations. Sort of just go through that with a little you know, more care as opposed to just rushing through it so quickly. So you can really sort of see what the concepts are behind there. As well as the whole notion of modeling different pieces that you don't find in the library. Because it's, you know, it's quite common we get to these different situations where you just can't find it on Revit City or in the default <coughs> library. And you need to make your own little pieces. So let's start with annotations. And for working with the annotations, what I'm going to do is actually work with, oh, it's the floor plans for this is the actual house that got submitted. And if I zoom on into the floor plan view, you'll see there's actually a lot of annotations added to it. It's not just the information that's in the model, but I end up needing to add all sorts of stuff in here. I put dimensions on it to show the lengths between the different wall segments. We put some notes on there to sort of explain things. Oh, this whole issue about the maximum drop in the threshold, that's something that we actually are required by code to put on there. It's, it's in the model. If I showed you the 3D model, you'd actually see that that condition is met in the model. Okay, But sometimes you have to actually go through and just spell it out incredibly explicitly, because that way it's on the drawings, and it's actually part of the contract. So those are some sort of text annotations that are in there. You'll also see. Actually, for your sheets, we're going to go ahead and put some, let's use the guideline of, let's get some dimensions on your rooms, like the overall dimensions of the house and some dimensions to show people, that sort of stuff. Um, little notes like, oh, the issue of like threshold drop, you don't need to put things like that. But go ahead and think about putting notes on things that may not be incredibly obvious in the view. For example, if this big blob over here in the dining room is a sideboard or something like that, and it just looks like a big rectangular blob, it'd probably be helpful to put a label on it and say, oh, this is a sideboard, or these are some uh, washer and dryer cabinets, whatever it is, just to kind of give a little you know, meaning to that. Because otherwise, just looking at these big orange boxes, you may not understand the meaning in there. Okay. Tags, let's go ahead and put some tags on so we can sort of cross-reference things between the doors and window schedules. So all these different tags, like the 12, the 19, the G1, those are all cross-references to specific sizes like in the door and window schedule. <coughs> and we'll show you, that's actually very easy to add if you don't have those back in there already. Okay, so we're going to start with the whole idea of dimensions. And uh, just really get you going on the dimensions, let me approach it this way. This drawing already has a lot of dimensions and notes in there. So rather than kind of starting with this one, I'm actually going to duplicate this without the detailing so we can sort of get a, a clean start, probably closer to where you are. And I'll just take the floor plan view, and I will do a right click on it and say duplicate it without the detailing, because I just want sort of the clean view. Now this view is fairly clean. It still has a few more things on it that I might want to get rid of. There's these things called the grid lines, and I'll go ahead and take those out. Because those are good. I use those for aligning the structure, but I may not want to show those to the client right offhand. So I have visibility graphics to go through and turn those off. Notice also I don't have any furniture in here. I have casework, the cabinetry, but I don't have the furniture. So I might want to turn that on. So I'll take this view, and I'll visibility graphics it. I will say, turn on the furniture. The grid lines are actually under annotation categories. I can sort of turn off the grids. and make those disappear. Okay, So this may be a little bit closer to where you are right now in terms of some furniture, some general layout. Some things like the oven actually had a label associated with it in the dishwasher, but other ones we're going to want to add in here. 
So we're going to start with the whole idea of dimensions. And dimensions really start with the notion of really different types of dimensions that you might want to put in there. They live under the annotations tab. And there's these different types, ang aligned, linear, some ones that are good for curved segments, and some things that give you information about specific spots in the model. The big one difference between aligned and linear is as follows. If you have walls which are not parallel to the x and y axis, they're running at some sort of angle, okay, aligned dimensions will follow the angle of the wall. Okay, they'll always follow whatever angle the wall is doing. So it'll give you the length along the angled wall. Okay? Linear dimensions are a little different. They will go through and actually resolve things back into the horizontal and the vertical. It'll always give you the x, y. So the angled wall gets sort of resolved into the x, y components. Okay? So you know, it's not going to be a huge difference in terms of what we're doing. Nine times out of ten, I put aligned dimensions on things. That tends to be the more, you know, in, in most cases, if you have walls which are running parallel to the x and y axis, it won't make any difference. But I'll go ahead and choose aligned as my default type. Let's take a look at what's available to us. Uh, let me go back to here. Choose aligned. And let's take a look. As we place dimensions, we have the whole notion of really what we want to dimension to. Because as you're placing dimensions, you're going to put in these little things called witness lines, which sort of show a surface that you're dimensioning to. And you can choose whether you want to go to the wall center lines, the face of the wall, or one of the cores of the wall. And often, just for speed, as you're going through and doing preliminary design work, you'll just mention to the center line of the walls. So for example, I can come from the center of this wall to the center of that wall. And when I click out here in the drawing area, not actually clicking on something I'm going to choose, uh, an object, it'll put the dimension out there, and there you see it's 12 feet. Okay, that's going to wall center lines. And often at this level of our design work, we just do the center lines. Okay, later on it will be more important to actually go to more accurate places within the wall, but centers is a pretty good starting point. Okay, how you use the other places are as follows. Let's kind of talk about them. You can dimension to the wall faces or to the faces of the core, or the center of the core. I'd rarely use that. If I am, you've got to think about who's using the dimensions and what they're doing with that dimension. For example, as I'm going through and building a house, the person who typically comes through first in terms of really establishing where the walls are is going to be the framer, the person who's actually putting down the wood carpentry, kind of putting the studs in the wall and things like that. So what happens is typically the framer will read the dimensions on the plans. They'll put the walls where they want to put them, okay, based on those dimensions. Then everyone else sort of has to follow at that point. Whoever's putting the sheetrock on the wall is just going to put it on the inside of the studs. He doesn't really have much of a choice. Okay, he doesn't really need a dimension. He just is going to put it on the face of the studs. Same thing with the person put it in the stucco on the outside of the wall. They'll just sort of take whatever the wood wall is and put the stucco on the outside. So you've got to think about who's driving the equation. Okay, and it's often the framer. Okay, so if it is the framer, what they would typically like to see is actually the faces of the core. They'd like to know the face of the stud. You could give them the center of the core, okay, but then they'd have to do some math in their mind to split the difference and try and figure out where the edge of the wall is going to be. But faces of the core is often a good choice for construction documents. So if you want to go to faces of a core, let me just show you what that looks like. But for right now, you can probably stick with the wall center lines. Faces would be like as follows. Let me come in close. And you can actually sort of see all my different faces. Okay, What I can do is actually, I've chosen, let me say I prefer to go to the faces of the core. Pop out here. I'll hover nearby. I can tab if I want to. It'll give me the different options. The wall center line, the center of the wall, or center of the core the center of the core, the center of the wall, and that's actually the face of the core. And I can come over here, and I'll grab that face of the core. I can put something down there. Actually, I have an extra dimension right here. Let me show you how we'll get rid of that in just a second. Okay, little mistake got made in terms of what's going on. This dimension actually has several different segments. And really what I want to do is get rid of that middle witness line. I don't really care about that one. That's kind of showing me something I don't want to measure to. So it sort of takes us to the next point, and that is really how do you edit dimensions. And when I want to go through and edit dimensions, what I need to do is actually select the dimension, 
and then I can work with those little blue dots on the witness lines to control them. So I can go to that blue dot and I can right click on it, say let's delete that witness line. That's how I get rid of an excess one. So if you have excess witness lines, feel free to delete them. Let me zoom on out. If I want to add to a dimension, I have that little one foot four dimension, but I want to continue it to actually go to the other side of the wall or the other side of the room. I can choose the dimension and I can say, oh, actually let me just choose the whole dimension. I will say control click on that and I will get, oh, got the wrong thing. The whole dimension. Right click, I can edit the witness lines and edit witness lines lets me go ahead and <coughs> basically choose another point. So you're going to play around a little bit in terms of adding and taking out witness lines, just trying to get witness lines to show up to the objects, the, the surfaces that you think are the right ones to, uh, to dimension to. Okay, If you have something like this where I've already placed a witness line to the center and I want to move it, again that's going to be one of these right click operations. What I can do is come on down here to this corner. I can choose the dimension line. I can right click on that and I'll say move it, then I can move the face of it over to, oh come on you, there it is, right there, and get them in line with each other. So dimensions, go ahead and add them in, again if you want to go to center lines that's A-OK -okay. for the level of modeling we're doing right now at the preliminary design stage, that's A-OK. -okay. Sort of splits the difference and that's fine. Let me add some more dimensions in here. I can, for example, put a dimension from, oh, if I wanted to know how big that piece of cabinetry was, it's a big entertainment center. I can go from the face of the cabinet on this side to the face of the cabinet on that side. So I know it's about 13 foot too big. In this case, what it's trying to do is actually dimension to the, uh, the floor when I go clicking. And I can sort of extend some other dimensions too. Let me put a dimension in here. I will go just from the, uh, the center line of this wall. If I can get in there, let me zoom in a little closer. I'll tab and I'll go out to the center line of that column. Now, dimensions are often a two-way street in that we have some dimensions the reporting information, but we could also use them to drive the geometry. So if, for example, you choose the post, notice what happens. Okay, I'll turn it off. I'll choose the post. Watch what happens to the dimension line. When I choose it, it'll actually sort of blue. It'll become a little smaller. It'll turn to a darker shade of blue. That means that I can edit it. I can start changing the values. So if I want to, I can say, no, that's not going to be 16, that's going to be 17 feet. And it'll move the geometry for me. Okay, so use that to your advantage. You can use them to either drive, you could also use them to constrain if you want to. You can keep things from moving. Okay. But dimensions sort of, uh, they're not only reporting information, they could also drive geometry for you. Okay, so go ahead and put your dimensions in here. In general, let me give you sort of just a good general rule for how you could go ahead and approach using your dimensions. It's quite common to do something like this. Let me show you the dimensions at the front of the house. I will often have dimensions that look something like this. I'll have one big string of dimensions, which is the entire width of the house, and then I'll have another string of dimensions inside of it Okay, which are the individual wall segments that sort of make up that entire dimension. It's nice to have an overall. If I put all the little small segments in there, someone would have to add up and in their mind kind of get all, do all the math. So let's make it easy on them. We'll do the overall, then we'll sort of break it into the segments. So how would that look as you were doing your dimensions? Let me come down to the front of the house and kind of show you how that might work. I might start by doing dimensions. Again, I'll just leave them to the center line to make it easy. I'll go from the center here all the way to, oh, I can do it to the post, or I think it's actually measured to the center of that wall. No, it probably was that post. Yep, 
then after I have that, I can come back and do another dimension, which is just going along the individual segments. Everywhere I click, I'm putting another subdimension. Okay, so go ahead and put some dimensions in there. That's really all we have in mind in terms of what you need to do. So don't go ahead and over dimension, but at least you know think about some uh, scheme that'll give us some sense of how big your house is. Okay, stretch those things out. Okay. Now, as you're going through and working with dimensions, a couple other styles you want to know about. There's these radial dimensions, or these ones for curved segments. Let's just show you how those look. I'll go ahead and make a little curved segment out here, just so we have something to work with. Okay, curves are much harder in terms of trying to dimension. And this sort of gets to the comment about curved walls, and oh, are curved walls really hard to build? It's not so much that they're hard to build, it's they're hard to lay out. Okay, I can make the studs do that. That's no problem. The problem is someone actually has to go through and figure out there's a center point to that radius, so they have to locate that center point. Then they have to go through and sort of draw out the radius and somehow scribe that in the ground or scribe that with a pencil or something like that. And some people just think that sounds like an awful lot of work. So if your comp contractors are complaining, it's not that they can't do it, it's just sort of more work. Okay, so you can measure the radius. That's actually the truest thing we might need. You could go ahead and also report the angle. The angle will be from one surface of the curve to the other surface of the curve. And I could think of that as 238 degrees, or I could think of it as 121, whatever way you want. But honestly, you know, angular dimensions, like how many contractors are going to be out there where the, tra the transit sort of swing in an angle, like most people won't understand it that way. So what they will try to think of it as is more just the dimension along the curve, which is the arc length. Okay, The arc length sort of takes three picks. You have to first pick the wall, then you can pick the ends of the arc, and then we'll get sort of what the uh, circumference is of that arc. Okay, But again, you know, it's a little hard to measure unless you have, well, if you have a flexi tape, you can do that and sort of wrap it around. But it's actually it's a little bit hard to measure, and that's why people that's, that's why they're complaining about curves. It's really more that it's just sort of hard to dimension it. Well, it's easy for you to dimension. It's much harder for them to lay it out. That's the issue. Okay. Now, dimensions actually have a style to them. So let's talk about that. All these different uh, types of annotations. If you want to pop back here. Dimensions, um, the text, all these different things. The appearance is controlled by a type. So let's talk about the type and how you can change those things if you want to. You don't have to, but you might notice that all oh, my dimensions are sort of they're showing up in a light blue color. I kind of like to use color to go ahead and sort of my light blue is the idea it sort of filters it out a little bit so you're not paying as much attention to it as the black lines which are hard lines and they sort of stand out a little more prominently. So how all these dimension styles are determined is you can choose a dimension and you look at the type or style. They'll show you there's some different styles available in here. There's one that has like no text showing, which I use occasionally. What's a diagonal dimension look like? That's not very interesting looking. Okay, let's switch back to the default linear style and show you how you can change that style. It's a type property. You're probably getting tired of hearing everything's a type property, it seems, in Revit. But when LS fails, go to the type properties and you can probably change things the way you want. The colors down here, if I don't want these like blue dimensions, I want to make them, oh, purple. I can make them purple. I can choose the font. I can choose the format of the font, the text size. Let me go ahead and change the font. Oh, I'll do a different font called Comic. It doesn't look too different. I can choose whether they're going to be opaque or transparent. Opaque is actually handy if you have a lot of information on your drawings. It puts like a white box behind the dimension so you can sort of see the actual dimension and not get it confused with the lines in the background. You can also choose the format. So let me go ahead and, oh, this is like purple dimensions in the Comic Sans. If that's what I like, super. If I prefer, I can change the type properties to, oh, how about instead of showing them in imperial units, what if we decide to show them all in, oh, how about meters with two decimal points? Say okay to that. Okay, so 
If you've done your design, you need to send the plans somewhere else where they prefer the metric system. Quite easy just to go ahead and change everything. Or you could even have two sets of dimensions. You could have the imperial and the, uh, yeah, the metric just right next to each other. Okay, whatever is going to be the most useful as you go ahead and always think about your audience and what's going to be the most useful to them. That's your final guideline. Okay, let's go ahead and just do something with these sort of spot elevations and the spot slopes, show you what that's useful for. You can use them out here in the floor plan views, but they're not as common to use there. A spot elevation is as follows. I can choose and just put down a spot. So that's actually at minus 2 relative to the project 0. The top of this surface over here is actually at 1 foot 6. Okay, so that's like a little bench or something like that. The top of this surface over here is 2 foot 8, which is actually the top of like a kitchen counter or a bathroom countertop. Kitchen counter is uh, 3 feet. So I can go ahead and put like either the elevation or I can put the slope. Slope won't make so much of a, oh, it won't make, so, if for flat floors, it won't really sort of tell you very much information. If I go up to the roof, it might make a little more, inst or uh, give you a little more information. So if I go ahead and say, put the slope on here, okay, I can see that's a 312 roof or something like that. Again, I'm just reporting information. So I can't see that slope. When the person's laying it out, they'd like to know what that slope is to help them with the framing. So you can sort of put it right in there, kind of give them some information. These sort of elevations and these slopes are very useful when you're doing, uh, or yeah, spot elevations and spot slopes in elevation views. So I have my big floor levels out here. That's OK. But if I want to go through and actually go a little bit further, I can say the elevation of really, oh, the top of the rail or something like that. Let me zoom on in. So the top of this railing is going to be at, did I get it? That's funny. OK, there it is. The top of the post, anyway. Must not like me to grab the top of a round surface. Same thing with the slopes. I can come over here and put the slopes on. I'll say here. I'm choosing some surface which isn't sloped. Let me undo that. Let me try again. Annotations, spot slope. There we go. That's 312 in that direction. Okay. So dimensions, go ahead and put them in there. They actually are useful for driving things. Let's go ahead and try this. Let's see if I can actually make this work. I can say, oh, maybe not. Let me put a spot elevation. The rail, it's not going to let me get so much. I'll do a spot elevation on the balcony. Notice it's still a two-way relationship. I can go ahead and choose. I get a value there, and I can say 9 foot 2, and it'll actually lower the floor. Okay, So you can drive these things in a number of ways. You have to just another way of sort of adjusting the floor. I could have gone to the instance properties and done it that way. But it's all just, and really what's happening with a lot of the things I'm showing you today, it's there's information in a model. And all I'm really doing is giving you other ways to pull that information out and make it accessible. So it's an instance property, but you could actually put it on the drawing and choose what you want to show. Okay, Annotations in terms of dimensions, that's kind of it. So again, what you really want to be looking for is, at the early design stage, let's just get some wall center line based dimensions to kind of give us the overall kind of shape and size of the rooms and all that stuff. Just enough to kind of get us going. And a good trick is if you want to keep your uh, drawing fairly neat on the inside, what we'll often do is instead of putting the dimensions inside the building, see what I do? I tend to pull them outside the building. Okay, That way your rooms don't get all cluttered up with all that dimensional information makes it easier for everyone to kind of find them. It's very, you know, you don't want your contractors to have to hunt for the dimensions. They might miss them. Okay, next up, let's talk about text. Text is kind of an easy concept because text is really just wherever you need to put some sort of information to sort of help explain what's going on, we can just add text notes. So let me go down to this little library space in here. Like, I happen to know, since I designed this space, that that's a window bench. That's a little seat that's running all along the window and stuff like that. That may not be very obvious to you looking at it. 
And you may not know, those are some tall bookcases, and this is some pass-through kind of piece of cabinetry over there. So how am I going to explain that to you? I give you a 3D view or an elevation, but even in the floor plan view, it might be helpful to sort of go through and put an annotation in here. I can put some text. And as I'm putting text, I have the choice of, oh, do I want to align it left, center, or right? And also, do I want to put a leader on it? A leader is the notion of like, it's an arrow that's kind of pointing to things. So this is sort of just stylistic. You can go ahead and put things with no leader. Let me center this, and I'll just go down here and say, this is going to be, I'll drag out a little box, and I'll call this like the window seat. Okay. This thing over here, I can put a label on that and call it a tall bookcase. If I put a leader on it, what I'm going to do is as follows. Click start the arrow, click finish the arrow, or put the elbow in the arrow, click again, and now I'll call that a tall bookcase. I can tab around, choose that, and move it. I can rotate them, too. Okay, that's enough to get you going. How do you change the font size? Font size. That, you might imagine, is actually part of the type. Okay, so, like in dimensions, we can choose different types. We can often create different types for different types of things we want to display. So I can have floor plan note big versus floor plan note small. But then if you want to define what floor plan note small is, you can go to the type properties and either change it here or create a new one. So the text size is 332nd. Let me make it even like 1 16th, even smaller. Oh, I can give it a different font like Broadway. Say OK. That's just not very good looking at all, is it? So let's go ahead and choose that. I'll change its type properties. Give it a different color. Whatever it is, it's going to make the most sense to you. Okay. I often go ahead and actually use color. I print my drawings in color because I don't have to produ produce mass groups of them. I like color as a way of helping people organize information. So when I'm doing electrical plans, I put all the power notes in blue. I put the lighting notes in orange. I sort of try to add layers of information because as you start having very complicated drawing sets, you know, all that information really gets to be very just overwhelming. It's nice if you sort of know, oh, I need to be looking at all the blue things right now. It just kind of helps you filter out the information as you're looking for things. Okay, so I can go through and put tags like that, or a text that looks like that. Let me go through, I'll show you a curved one. Not that difference, it just has a curved leader instead. A one segment leader, I don't like those very much. They look like this. We get again, because I've chosen all these things to be of the same type, if I edit the type properties, okay, and I'll make them all oh, deep blue instead, automatically change everywhere. Fantastic for consistency. You like consistency across all these things. So use the whole notion of types to really help organize your information. That way you can like, uh, yeah, just across all your different drawings. If you make, need to make a change, it'll affect everything. OK, text. Any sort of quick? Text tends to be fairly simple. Yeah, as you're going through and create, yes, no? Yeah, no worries. We will show you. I will repeat the arced one. It's under text. I will say, let's go ahead. Let me cancel out of that. I will choose the curve. And it's I just choose the point, and then I pull out the arc. And I can then sort of say another. Say again? Oh, the curve dimensioning. No worries. Let's go back out there. Let me zoom in. We will choose here. I will go to annotations. See, oh, let me do the radius first. That's the easy one. I'll just grab it in the middle. 
and pull on out. So the two other variations are this whole thing about the angle. For the angle, what I always have to do is grab one end, then I have to get the other end. Then I can get sort of the inner or the outer. And the one that always confuses me, but I like the best, is arc length. I have to sort of choose the surface, like that's really what arc I'm dimensioning, then choose the ends. No worries. In metric. Okay, so annotations, text, and dimensions. Just go ahead and add enough to explain what's going on. Okay, what I want to sort of look at next, and the final thing we'll look at with the annotations today, is really the whole notion of tagging. And again, let me kind of take a look at this and show you what it's all about. What we have going on here is we have some tags displaying right now. We have some <coughs> tags, number 11, number 15, 16, 17. These are door tags. Those are all just referring to different doors that are appearing in a door schedule. So rather than having to put all the information about the type, the size, the style of the door, who's going to be the manufacturer here in the plans, I'm going to keep that off in a nicely organized table, and I'll reference it by choosing number 11. Okay, so number 11 will go through and take care of getting me to a spot in the table. 15 will take me to a different spot in the table. Okay, similarly with the windows, C is a type of window, D1, D2. Those are all different types of windows. And if you want to see what those actually are, we'll come on back. We'll go to the schedules. And if you have a window schedule or a door schedule set up, you'll see what 11, 12, 13, and 14 refer to. So here we are, we're looking at a table. 11 is actually the mark. It's a unique identifier for the door. Can you can see, referencing that, I can see who the manufacturer is, what the model is, is it interior, exterior, what the dimensions are, any of the parameters, any of the data I want to keep about that door. And we can add even more parameters to it. So it's just a cross-reference. And really what you want to do is choose which information it is that you want to display on okay, the drawing. Because you have some choices. The big choices tend to be as follows. Most people tend to put either the mark, Okay, that's the unique identifier. So like you, every door has a unique ID, like the Stanford ID. Every one is unique, okay, and no two are the same. Okay. The other sort of thing is called the type mark. It's not actually displayed in this table. We tend to use type marks more with windows because, oh, for a building like Y2E2, if you actually went around the facade of the building and counted, you'd probably find at least, oh, 60 or 70 different windows that actually have the same exact size and dimensions to them. Okay, there's on all on different sizes. So rather than calling out every window, window one, window two, window three, with windows we often sort of say that's just window A versus window B, and then every time I see A, I know it's going to be a window of that type. Now, I can't give you a good answer to why we itemize doors versus type windows, but in residences we tend to do it that way. When for a big building like this, I bet the doors are typed too. That's a type A door, and there's probably oh, like 300 of them inside the building or something like that. And that's fine. Yeah, you don't really need to sort of get to all the detail. It really depends whether you need to call it out or not. Okay, let's go back over to the floor plan and let's show you how this works in terms of being able to cross reference things. So I'll start with the one that's already completed and we'll add some to the one that isn't. So here's door number 11. That's referring to the mark for door number 11. Okay, I can often choose different values. Actually, my door tag that I have loaded in the project doesn't have much information available in it, so let me try instead. I'll go to the window tag and show you what's available there. It has a type, like everything else has a type. And I have the choice between a window tag, which is a type mark. Okay, that's type 214. I have the individual mark, okay, which is C in this case. Or I can even go ahead and do something like show the dimensions, which is 42 by 42. You can really go ahead and pull any value out of that table you want to and display it here. So if you want to put the manufacturer here, if you want to put the contractor who's going to be responsible for replacing that window, you can put that here. You can put the type of glazing, whatever it is that makes the most sense to you, you can put in that tag. Okay. The most common things being mark and type mark, but go ahead and you can sort of use that for whatever you like. So for example, oh, let's say I want to go through and 
Let me create a schedule of my plumbing fixtures. I don't think I have something like that. Let me go through and I will say, let's create a view. Now someone's gonna have to order all these plumbing fixtures, so let's schedule them for them. I'm gonna go through and get some plumbing fixtures. What fields do I wanna show? Let me go ahead and I'll give a mark. I'll give a type mark. So every toilet will have an individual ID, but all the ones that share the same type will share the same type mark. I can go ahead and put in the, uh, the family. I can also put in the type. I can put in the manufacturer and the model number and all those things. So I'll come back here and I have a table. Actually, you sort of see we already have some of these things identified. Okay, some are tubs, toilets, some are sinks, some actually have a manufacturer associated with them. So how do I go through and use this? If I want to go through and tag an item, what I do is I go to the annotations and I say tag. Okay, let me go ahead and choose that plumbing fixture. Let me go ahead and choose that plumbing fixture. Notice it just has a little question mark there right now. I think that's because I'm trying to show the mark. Now we'll type a value in there and you'll see real quickly. Let's say that's uh, fixture A. Let me tab on in there. Hang on. There it is. I'll make that type A. I'll go ahead and let this be type B. It's kind of hard to get into what I want, which is actually I want to choose it, but I want to get in and get this the text. Why won't you help me? Do that again. I'm tabbing to try and get this right on that. Yeah, it's not letting me do it very easy. Let me do it the other way. I'll just go to the schedule and put it on that side. So if I go to my plumbing fixture schedule, you'll see all the toilets are now type A. I can make the sinks type B. I can make the tubs type C. Make the kitchen sink type D, whatever I want to do in there. And what's happening is I go through and put the values in here, is back over on that plan. Okay, you'll see the A, the B, they're entering in here also. So again, I have a way of cross-referencing. So I can go ahead and just sort of let it exist there, or if I want to, I can go through and choose that. Yeah, it's not giving me the option there. Let me do it for the windows. I can edit the family, take a look at the tag, and you actually have the option of changing exactly the information that's displayed. Let me kind of come on down here and show you how that works. There's a piece of text that's displayed, and we can even edit that, and you actually can choose any of the different fields that are over here, okay, and actually make the uh, tag sort of display that. Okay, now, you won't do that for this assignment. You know, don't worry about going that deep into it in terms of what's going on. I just want to sort of give you the idea that these tags really just pull database information, whatever parameters you want, as many parameters as you want, whatever's going to be most useful for you. So, and if we think about tags versus uh, text, the nice thing about tags is it's live information out of the database where text is static. Okay, so tags are better than text because if you change things in the schedules, they t you know, they'll change on the plans. It's just a much more powerful concept because it's linked. Yes, for some. Do you have to load the tag as a table? Because in the moment you put something on the yes. your, your items load as a table? You do have to load tags. So let's go and show you what that's all about. And we'll do a real quick tag thing and finish up with this. OK, uh, I'm not going to save the changes there. If you're trying to tag something and it just hasn't been tagged in the past, let me kind of annotate. Let me go ahead and tag like a wall or something like that. 
Oops, I guess that has been tagged in the past. If you try to tag something that hasn't been tagged in the past, I'm going to try tagging the refrigerator. Oh, I have so many tags in this project. It's really uh, it's hard to find something that isn't. How about the columns? The columns? Let's try that. No, they're tagged too. <laughs> um, I'm pretty thorough. <laughs> yeah, but what it is, if you're asked to sort of go through and tag something, maybe not the floors. Ah, there it is. You get this message. What it wants you to do is say, yes, I'll load it. And what you do is you go out to the library, and in annotations, you'll find different types of tags. So see if you can find a floor tag. There it is. You can load it in, and then I can put this tag on the floor. This tag's actually kind of an interesting one. It's showing me the material. OK, so the one, the yes. one I loaded just showed question mark inside. Is there anything else? OK, what that means is that whatever value it's showing, it might be the mark or the type mark. There's just no value associated with it yet. So go to either the schedule and put a value in for that, and it'll display, or vice versa. No worries. OK. Let's go ahead, Wooly. Oh, one last thing on tagging. Let's go to the floor plan. OK, for your drawings, what would be really great to do, since you have these door and window schedules that are already been defined, you just have to sort of drag them into the sheets, it'd be really nice to have put tags on your doors and windows to make sure that they're referencing to those doors and window schedules. OK, and here's how you can do that. If you've been placing your doors and windows, you may have a lot of door and window tags already hanging around in the floor plan. If you've been placing things in 3D, they may not be there. So if you want to quickly add the tags to all the missing ones, okay, you can do it a couple of different ways. I can tag, and I can choose even the style of a tag. Let me go ahead, and I'm going to show the uh, marks instead. So under Windows, I can choose what style of tag. I'm going to show the mark. Okay, and I can go clicking on those one at a time. And I'm clicking on Windows and placing those tags in there. Everything's kind of good. However, as with most things, if there's something like that that gets very repetitive, you might imagine there's a shortcut for doing a bunch of them, and there is. Right next to tag by category, there's tag all. And what tag all gives you the ability to do is actually just choose an entire category of objects, like windows, and I'll use that kind of tag. And I'll just say, I could put a leader on it if I want to, choose the orientation, say OK. And what it just did was actually tagged every window on the floor. OK, so go ahead and use that if you want to as a really quick way of just sort of getting those tags back in your drawing because you're missing them right now. So you can do it individually. You can do it separately, either way you like. OK, so tags, just a really good way of getting access to the database of information and displaying that. And we'll play more and more with that. That tagging is going to become a very central feature to how we get information in and out of the database. OK, I'm going to leave Anna to do that as part of the elevations. It'll make more sense over there. OK, let me switch over to elevations instead. OK, go back to the plan, take a look out there. Let's see where our elevations are. OK, the elevations, they've been hanging around out here, the default elevations, north, east, west, and south. And some people sort of wonder where they come from. How are they defined? And let's take a look at that. Every elevation is actually defined by a little marker, a marker which sort of shows where the elevation is. And then there's a cut line associated with that elevation. So if I go back to the floor plan view, and I go out and look for the markers, you'll actually see them. There's the elevation marker, which is sort of for the eastern elevation. And if I click on that, you'll actually get the cut line. Let me zoom on out so you can see it. That's the cut line right there. Okay. So if that is my cut line, let's go ahead and start playing around with what that actually does. This is going to be very much like doing the cut plane. Wherever I drag that line is where the view is going to be cut. So let me even, let me close everything that's hidden, and then I'll like uh, tile these so you can sort of see them together. Okay, let me get the east elevation. And now we'll do a little tiling so that you can actually see things. OK, I got my floor plan. I got my elevation. Let me zoom up on each so you get a sense of what's up. There's the elevation. Here's the floor plan. There's the marker. So I go moving it in. Everything's fine. I move it in. Everything's kind of groovy. I move it on in. Everything's still looking outside the building. I push it into the building. And all of a sudden now, 
Actually, we're sort of above the balcony right now, so you can't hardly see what the difference is. Okay, there we go. Okay, all we've cut through the building. Let me even add shadows to that so you can sort of see that a little bit better. I'm going to shade it. How about that? Okay, yeah, that's a little bit too much. That was off again. Okay, so if I go through and I adjust the cut line, okay, we're outside the building. I adjust the cut line, we're inside the building. Okay, so that's what the cut line does. It's really, and you'll figure out pretty quickly, there's very little difference between a section and an elevation. It's really kind of the same concept. It's just a camera that cuts vertically as opposed to cutting horizontally. Okay, so good with that? Okay, next up, let's show you some variations on this cut line. One is the whole idea of cropping these views, and let's show you how that works. I'm in my elevation, I'll turn on the crop and turn on the crop region. Let me zoom out so you can see what I just did. There's the crop region. Let me pull that crop in close. A lot of us did this on assignment one, just to be able to get the views on the sheets. Okay, so we're cropped in a lot tighter. Actually. Even so you know, you can crop vertically too, and that's often a very good thing to do. If you don't really need to see so far down into the ground, you can bring that up. I can sort of bring that down too. Okay, so I can get in much tighter. When I do those things, and I come back over here, okay, notice that the crop line, or the cut line's actually gotten a little bit smaller and has these little blue dots on the ends. Okay, those little blue dots indicate the edge of the, of the crop boundary. So if you go through and drag those dots, okay, you're changing the crop. Or if you change the crop over here, I think I just changed an object there. Okay, it'll change the length of those blue lines, or the blue dots. Okay, so those things are completely interlinked. You can adjust your crop either in the plan view or in the elevation view, whatever you want. Okay, so far so good? Okay. And let's give you the final variation on this funny line and what it does. And that's the whole notion of how far away you're looking at the building. Let me show you what I mean by that. So I got a region that's cropped. Let's come over here and take a look. We'll zoom over here. Take a look at the building. Now the building over here is actually showing us quite a bit of depth right now. You'll see that we're seeing what I think of as the face of the building. That's right in here. That's kind of the eastern face. But as we keep on looking back, we can see the stairway. We can see this little kind of covered entry sort of feature. We can see this sort of bump out on the second floor, which is actually really back over here. It's quite a bit in the distance there. And as you look at this elevation view, you could decide that's a little bit confusing. I'm looking too far into the background. If I really just want to focus on what's happening at the front face of the building, I don't want to see that far into the background. We'd be nice to be able to control that. Okay. So let's show you how you do that. Here we are. We got our elevation. That's the, where the cut is. That's the cropping. This whole notion of how deep you look into the building sounds an awful lot like, well, it's kind of like that whole view depth thing, that whole cut range view depth thing. And it actually is. In these views, it's called the clipping, the far clip, but it's really the same concept. And if we would like to adjust that, what we do is we choose the view. We say that we want to turn on the clipping. It's a view property. And I can say turn it on, far clipping. Right now it's not. Let me go ahead and clip it. And let's show you what the difference is. Okay, now it not only sort of shows us the boundaries of the crop, but it also has this depth pull. And as we pull back, we can go from just the face if I pull back a little further, I can get the uh, stairway in there. If I pull back a little further, I can start to see the carport or the little uh, covered entry right there. And if I pull back further, I'm going to get that sort of bump out over the second floor. So you can control how deep you want to look into the building. And especially on a very large project, you know, cropping and setting the right depth is really you know, critical to make sure you're really looking at the building you want or the part of the building you want to look at. You don't necessarily want to see the full depth because some feature of a wing that's very far in the distance could actually confuse the issue very much. Okay, so it'd be nice to be able to go ahead and turn those on and off. Okay, so each of these different elevations, the north elevation, the south elevation, these all have this notion of uh, where the cut line is. 
Is it cropped and is it clipped at the backside? And for any of those views, you can open the elevation. Okay, turn on the cropping. Let me look at the view properties and I'll turn on the clipping. Okay, right now it's sort of clipped itself right out of, uh, you don't even see it anymore. But let me go through here and I'll pull that back so you can actually see the front of the building again. Okay. If I want to crop that, let me zoom out over here. I can pull that in over here. So really, feel free to use whatever view makes the most sense to you in terms of doing that. Okay. Once you're here and you've got it cropped and clipped and everything looking the way you want it, okay, all the other principles still apply. So if we want to, for example, in this elevation view, if you don't want to see these plantings, you think the plantings are sort of confusing the view, that's a visibility graphics. You can turn those off. I'll open visibility graphics and turn off the plantings. Okay, now they're not there. I can shade it if I want to. I can adjust the scale if I want to. I can turn on the shadows if I want to. Just whatever you think is going to sort of portray that in the most effective way to your clients as you're trying to sell them your design. Okay. So two more notions about elevations before we take our break. And let me show you kind of just the whole notion of how you create a new elevation. And uh, what these little markers mean. Here's what I want to show you. Okay, the idea is there's the existing elevations that have already been set up. That part's good to get going. But if you want to go through and create a new elevation, here's how you got to do it. It's one of the tools that's under the View tab, and it's right here. It's called Elevations. I can just choose the main elevation type. And if I go hovering around the outside of the building, notice that the little marker for the elevation, it'll kind of hug up to the building as you hover near it. It'll try and find a wall and try to draw the elevation parallel to that wall. Okay, so that's pretty good. In general, that's what you want it to do. You'd like to have elevations be parallel to your walls. That way, they're the most accurate. So again, just grab the little elevation tool. And when you bring it on down, you'll sort of be able to get to the inside of the wall or the outside of the wall, wherever you place it. Okay, now, when you place a new elevation, it'll try to sort of crop things to be about right for the wall that you're up near. So if you place it on the outside, okay, we have some new elevation. It's showing up out here. Okay. If I place another elevation, though, on the inside, let me go ahead and put it inside the kitchen here so we can sort of see what's going on in the kitchen. Okay, I can put it in there instead. Let's go ahead and take a look at that elevation. This is an example of an interior elevation. And we often put elevations on the exterior of the building, but when we have rooms that have cabinetry and fixtures and things like that, in the same way I often put detailed plans, I'll put elevations there to help explain what's going on with the cabinetry and the architectural detailing. Now these type of views I typically bring up to a different scale, like half scale, bring it much bigger. I can crop that, again I can shade it, I can do whatever I want to. I can uh, visibility graphics to sort of highlight or de-emphasize different things that I want to do. Okay. Now, the reason I sort of start messing around with it and showing you about those different settings is it starts to bring up this point about, well, if I'm going to go ahead and have a bunch of different views and I'm going to go through and shade and set the level of detail and set the scale and set the visibility of graphics, it sure would be nice if I had some way to sort of grab the settings from one view and apply it to another view and apply it to another view so I don't have to keep on setting that time and time again. Okay? And there is something like that called a view template. And that's sort of an incredibly powerful thing to work with. Let me go on back there. There it is, saving and review, uh, reusing the view settings. What we want to do is if you find yourself creating different types of views again and again and you want some consistency between them, which you usually do, okay, view templates will really help you. So how that works is as follows. I, for example, have set up some settings here, this half scale shaded view for my uh, interior rendering or my interior elevation. If I would like that to be a template, I can say View Templates and create a template from the current view. 
By doing that, what it's going to do is I'll give it a name. I'll call this my interior elevations. Okay. I can go through and choose all the different features here. It's going to copy the features from the existing view, like half scale. I didn't actually set it up to find, but let me let that be part of my definition. I can go ahead and just turn on or turn off any overrides if I'd like to sort of set those. I have the model style. I have what discipline. All these different things that are associated with the view I can capture. Say OK. And then they're locked away under that name. Now where that gets to be useful is, let me come back over here. If it turns out I actually want to get some elevations of the other walls of the kitchen, I can just click on the other sides of the marker. I'll get some more elevation views. Okay, This is the other side of the kitchen. Here's another side of the kitchen. There's another side of the kitchen. Now these don't have the style yet. They're sort of all just kind of the plain white hidden line style. If I would like to quickly have them ha adopt the same settings, I could say apply a new template to the view, grab interior elevations, and as soon as I say OK, I will just apply that setting to that other view. So view settings is just kind of a quickie way of uh, getting some consistency across your documents. So apply the new template. I'll go for interior elevations and apply it to this view. And now all my different views, when I line them up on the sheet, will have the same color, the same scale, the same shading, show the same sorts of objects. Okay, So you may not use view templates for this assignment right now, but kind of keep them in the back of your mind. You know, Because as soon as you go through and sort of set up something that you really like, you know, we tend to have view templates set up for things like architectural drawings versus structural drawings. We tend to have them for exterior elevations, and you have sort of set styles. And the nice thing is, if you're working with several other people, you know that style can have all your decisions encoded, and people don't have to kind of make those decisions independently, and you get inconsistent drawings. Okay. Last thing on elevations is as follows. Let's go back to the floor plan view. I'm going to kind of close all these up. You might look at this marker over here, this big old elevation marker, and this one that's kind of hanging around out there. And you know, decide that you, know, you, you don't really like the look of it, because it's kind of hanging around. It just sort of looks like a big old box with some triangles on it. You know, it, it may not be doing much for you right now. Okay, Let me explain what it does do for you, and then you can decide whether or not you want to show it. Here's where it's useful. If I create a new sheet, and I'll put a sheet out here, and I start drawing some out, dragging some elevations to the sheet. Let me get that south elevation on a sheet, too. OK, let's go back in and take a look at those markers again. OK, the markers have a little more information to them now. OK, what the markers actually show us is where that elevation is located, on which sheet it's located, and also what the view number is on that sheet. So for example, here in the kitchen, I can tell that the east elevation is over there, but not the other elevations. And I would find it on sheet A102. If I come back over to the sheet again, and I place some more of the elevations in here. I already got that one up there. Let me get this one. As I continue to place the different elevations, that marker will get filled in with more information. So I can tell that it's views. 2, 4, and 5 on that sheet. Okay. Now, when you're working with a live 3D model, this is not so important because you can just actually click on the marker and real quickly get to that elevation view. In fact, this is probably the best part about the marker right here. If you're not sure where that view is, you can just double click on it and it'll take me right to that view. <laughs> Again, if you're not sure where it is, just double click and you'll go right to that view. Okay, so. Again, our projects have been pretty simple so far, but if you can start imagining of something that has 100 different views in it, the ability to find the marker and double click and get right to the view is very kind of convenient. Okay, But especially this is necessary when you print these things out, because for someone looking at it on paper, they need that marker so they can sort of see, oh, if I want to see this wall of the kitchen, where am I going to find it? I'm going to find it as whatever the view is on that other sheet. And it's actually completely dynamic. I can rename that. I can say, oh no, that's sheet A501. Two. 
say this is going to be my interior elevations. Okay, and as soon as I rename that sheet, you'll see that actually the marker is updating too. So completely dynamically linked, which is very, very handy because you don't have to worry about maintaining all those different things. Okay, so that's what the markers are good for, especially when you print and you want the markers. As you're designing and just sort of sharing with your clients though, if you don't want to see that big old marker sitting around right in the middle of the kitchen, what do you need to do? Okay, it's a type of object, it's an annotation, and you want to filter it out of the view. Okay, which should tell you that, okay, visibility graphics, let's go to the annotations, and we can actually turn off the elevation markers right there. Okay, they're still there, they still exist. We can bring them back in another view. In fact, this is a case where, a good example of, you may want to have one view which has all that stuff turned on so that you can real quickly navigate around and get to what you need to, but then have all that stuff hidden that you're going to present to the client. Okay, and just keep two duplicate views so you don't have to keep on, you know, if you find yourself going back to visibility graphic more than two or three times in a view, okay, it's a good sign that you probably want to duplicate the view and have two views, each of which have different settings to them. 